before we get started on this, I am not, okay? I am not a foreign policy expert. I am a political edutainer. I am, however, very anti-war. And I want to be upfront with you about my personal biases. I am, I am a very anti-war person, okay? War is truly, truly more horrible than you can imagine, okay? And as a result, I tend to be very, very, very against war, okay? And that is the perspective I take into all the things I do, because I think that is more important than whatever squabbling details various gigantic state entities uh, have for justifying their wars, okay? So, first, we are going to pop onto this right here. Okay. Okay. So, this is Arwa Ibrahim, a reporter for Al Jazeera, Middle East, and North Africa. Okay? So, this is somebody who is very well sourced on this and tends to write quite a lot. Okay? We're going to talk right now about their article that was written on the 9th of August. This is the first one. Taliban claims capture of more provincial capitals in Afghanistan. Now, now keep in mind, we are rewinding just a couple of a couple of days. As you can see, right now it's the 16th. This is from the 9th. So this was 7 days ago, okay? So we're going to start and we're going to move forward in the timeline so that we can actually have a nuanced conversation about this, okay? Taliban claims capture of more provincial capitals. The battle between, between the Taliban and Afghan forces has intensified as foreign troops are scheduled to withdraw from the war-torn country. The Taliban has continued to advance on urban centers in Afghanistan after capturing smaller administrative districts in the past week, claiming to have taken over a sixth province capital in four days. So, what this is talking about here... The Taliban is a faction, is a political, a very powerful political faction in Afghanistan. They are in opposition to the Afghan government, which is backed by the U.S. and others. Okay, as of now, the Taliban has completely taken over Afghanistan. America has completely lost the war in Afghanistan. We withdrew. They took over the capital within days. Okay, we're not there yet, but we will get there. What has what happened first is that the Taliban essentially as America started to withdraw under Biden's withdrawal plan, the Taliban moved in very hard and they straight up attacked and took over provincial capitals. Basically, you can imagine that like taking over state capitals here in the United States. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is living in Afghanistan, a heavily armed force of people you may or may not agree with, or you may agree with partially, or you may disagree with uh, partially, is moving in and violently taking over capitals. So a state that you might that might be next to your state suddenly belongs to a different government. We have not had that happen here since the 1800s in the Civil War. You cannot. I, I think it's very hard for people to imagine what happens when the government that you had there is taken over by another government that has very different rules okay it's very 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 intense okay the cities of I ibak and sari pol join three other provincial capitals now fully under taliban control zaranj the capital of western nimruz province the city of shebergan the capital of northern zazjan Za province and i apologize for my pronunciation I'm not there. And Talakan, the capital of another northern province with the same name. Afghan forces have meanwhile tried to push back the Taliban's advance, alleging to have killed more than 500 members of the armed group. So this is explosive fighting all over the country. Okay? Here were the updates on Monday. The security situation is not going in the right direction, according to the Pentagon. Pentagon said that the security situation in Afghanistan was not going in the right direction which would mean favorable to the United States, according, this is because this is the Pentagon, after all. This is a great example of where we have to be very scrutinous here, because they're citing the Pentagon. Pentagon spokesman John Kirby said the U.S. was deeply concerned about the trend, but that the Afghan security forces had the capability to fight the Taliban. 
Now, I want you to notice, this was on August 9th. We now know that this was completely false. The Pentagon, the Afghan security forces did not have the capability to fight the Taliban. We now know this is true. Remember, we have the advantage of retrospect. These are their military forces. These are their provincial capitals, their people to defend. And it's really going to come down to the leadership that they're willing to exude here at this particular moment. Notice how this guy right here is putting all of it, all of the blame very strategically on the Afghan people. These are their military forces, their capitals, their people to defend. Despite the fact that we've been involved in, in Afghanistan for longer than many of you have been alive. But it's this Pentagon guy is telling you that it's all on the Afghan people. Residents of Afghanistan's Kunduz recount the Taliban takeover. This is important right here. What we're going to listen to here is, is reports of individuals on the ground, okay? Late on Sunday afternoon, the Taliban flew its flag from the main roundabout in the northern city of Kunduz. It marked the third time in seven years that the armed group had managed to wrest control of what the government had hoped would be a model for all of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. Okay, again, we're going to be taking a lot of moments here to talk about this stuff. I want you to imagine what it would be like. Okay, real quick, let's do a quick little let's do a quick little vote here. Have you lived in the same place for ten years? Yes or no? Okay. Have you lived in the same place for ten years? Not necessarily now, but at any point in your life. At any point in your life. Okay. Ten years. Okay. So a lot of you have. Damn, a lot of you have. Okay, that's really, really interesting. Okay. Two seconds till the po the the uh, poll ends. Okay. Those of you who have lived in the same place, which is about seventy-five percent of my audience, somewhere in that ballpark, somewhere between seventy and seventy-five percent of my audience has lived in the same place for ten years. I want you to think about what it would be like if, I'm sorry, three times. Over the last 10 years, you had a complete change in government, a total change in government from a U.S. backed style government to a Taliban government three times in 10 years. I don't think you can. I don't think most Americans can even imagine what that would be like to have all of the laws, all of the policing, all of the rules that you have to follow be changed and that and it gets to a point where the chaos is so intense you could be you you could basically be arrested for anything because you don't you might not even know who's in charge anymore okay like like imagine living a life where you don't even know who is the government currently well you might but it could change any day three times in seven years that's wild you know, one of the problems of the U.S.-backed government was that they were no different from the Taliban, in some cases worse. We're not even getting to that yet. We're not even going to get to that yet. What we're trying to do here is center the perspectives of the people who have lived through this, okay? That is what I'm interested in. I don't care about which, which power you think is more important or better. What I care about is the people. And I want people to understand what people are going through and why we should care, okay? And why we should think about this with reference to our own country. Residents speaking to Al Jazeera said the Taliban's offensive on the eponymous capital began early on Saturday morning. And by the next afternoon, the group had officially seized control of Afghanistan's fifth largest city. Okay, let's let's get a comparison here real quick. Okay, let's see. This city is Kunduz. Okay, let's take a look. This is the sixth largest city, fifth largest city now. It is. It has a population of about 300,000 people approximately. Let's see. Let's compare it to another, another American city. Let's find a city that's, that's similar here, okay? 
Let's see. One second. Let's get down here and let's take a look. So we are looking at a city approximately the size, for reference, approximately the size of Tampa, Florida, approximately the size of uh, Anaheim, California, Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, Newark, New Jersey is about the same size. The city of Newark, New Jersey, you know, the capital. Orlando is about the same size. Uh, Pittsburgh is about the same size. Uh, Buffalo, New York is about the same size. Reno. Uh, let's take a look. Um, Norfolk, Virginia is about the same size. Richmond, Virginia, about the same size. Tacoma, Washington, about the... Uh, actually, Tacoma is smaller. That's a good one. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Trent, I, my, my, my mistake. I forgot Newark is not it. But that, that's just a mistake. Small mistake. But you got it. Tacoma, okay? For those of you who live in my area, Tacoma, okay? Okay. Yonkers is smaller. Rochester, smaller. Little Rock, Arkansas, smaller. Montgomery, Alabama, smaller. Salt Lake City is smaller than this city that we're talking about here. What's that? Yeah, but I'm but seriously, huge. Okay, so we're talking a massive city. And I want you to think about that. You're just living in a city the size of Tacoma. You know, we're talking a city that has tons of people, tons of businesses, and over the course of one day, the government has completely changed. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the chaos, the pain, the unfathomable chaos and pain that would be wreaked upon your city? Okay? It's, it's, it's almost incomprehensible. A protracted war in the neighboring Afghanistan is Pakistan's nightmare scenario. Okay, so this is talking about the context between Pakistan and Afghanistan, which we're not going to talk about right now because that's not exactly what we're talking about. Biden unmoved on the Afghanistan exit. Biden is standing firm on a U.S. exit with limited options appearing to be on the table to reverse the Taliban's momentum. The decision to withdraw was made in full knowledge that what we were seeing now is, may is likely to happen, says Laurel Miller, the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. They knew this was going to happen. They've downplayed it, but they knew it was going to happen. Nearly 20 years of experience has shown us that just one more year of fighting in Afghanistan is not a solution, but a recipe for being there indefinitely. Okay, we're going to keep going. A rocket has exploded in the hospital compound belonging to medical humanitarian organizations in Lashkar Gah, the, the non-government or organizations have said on Twitter. Doctors Without Borders Afghanistan hospital was, hit, was also hit. Fortunately, there were no injuries at the Doctors Without Borders hospital. Hospitals are not a target. We again call on all parties to respect health facilities to ensure they are not put in harm way. In harm's way. So who knows who hit it? We don't even know yet who hit it. The explosion was very close to our emergency room and it could have been much worse, worse says Doctors Without Borders. But the hospital, the main hospital was hit. Notice that even in this report, they're mostly talking about the perspective of Doctors Without Borders, not even the hospital that was the primary target and got blown up. Can you imagine what that would be like if you went outside to the hospital maybe that you go to for your checkups and it's just blown up one day and you don't have a hospital anymore? You just don't have a hospital in your area. Gone. Just blown up. In Kunduz, many desperate families, some with young children and pregnant women, have abandoned their homes, hoping to reach the relative safety of Kabul which is 200 miles to the south, a drive that would normally take about 10 hours. Now, keep in mind that a lot of the people fleeing are not fleeing in vehicles. They're fleeing on foot. A 10-hour drive, 200 miles on foot, because you are scared that your home will be blown up. Because you're grabbing your things, your precious, whatever you have, your dog, your most precious uh, things, but only what you can carry if you're lucky, in a car, if you're not, on your back. 
And that's after living through three regime changes in your city. We're going to watch that in a minute, Shaloon. We'll get there. It's gotten worse. This is through through desert, mountainous terrain. You don't, you know, yeah. This is very, you know, we're talking about an incredibly intense experience for these people. We may be forced to walk until Kabul, but we're not sure if we could be killed on the way. Ground clashes were not just stopping for even 10 minutes, said a, a, an engineer by the name of Ghulam Rasul, who was trying to hire a bus to get his family to the capital as the sound of gunfire started reverberating through the she streets of his hometown. Pakistan urges global community to look into the meltdown of Afghan forces. Pakistan says the international community needs to look into the meltdown of the security forces in the face of the Taliban offensives instead of blaming Pakistan for the, the, for the situation. The capacity building, the training, the equipment, where is it? Issues of governance and the meltdown of Afghan national defense forces needs to be looked into. Pakistan should not be held responsible for the failures of others. So here's the, here's the game that we see where everybody points fingers at everybody else. Heavy fighting underway. We got a video here. Let's watch the video. Lashkargah, the capital of Helmand province and in the crosshairs of the Taliban. After fighting government forces for weeks on its outskirts, the armed group could be on the brink of taking its first city since the U.S. began its military drawdown. The Taliban publish videos of themselves in the center of Lashkargah and at the main market, asserting they had control of most. Now, it's funny when we get footage of places like Afghanistan, it's always very easy for us to take notice of the of the the shanty towns of the uh, impoverishment of the, the piles of rubble. OK. Um, it is very easy for us to take note of that. And I want you to remember why that is. Your, your hometown, wherever you live right now, would look like this or worse if your city had violently changed hands three times in the last seven years. No matter what, you might have... If you, you sit here right now watching this on the computer. You, you get to play your video games while you're listening to me or watch the stream or participate in chat or whatever. But your town would look exactly like this. If your infrastructure gets blown up, you just stop having it. If you're, if you're in, if, if, if there's a bomb that goes off down the road, you might lose internet forever. You might go from being somebody who's connected to the internet to just having to sit outside bored all day, every day. And it gets even worse if you're also having people, uh, shake you down. If you're also having the cops come after you. Uh, for or or whatever the the, the you know whatever the Taliban's uh, equivalent of the cops are, um, coming after you for violating some rule that they put into place. Okay, listen, I'm not talking about the boredom. This is over seven years. Obviously, when there is fighting actually happening, you have much bigger concerns. But what I'm talking about is the time in between. Seven years with three regime changes. You can't build anything. In, in that time or you can but it, it gets destroyed again so what do you what what do you do when 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 you lose water one day the next day you lose electricity and then you can't build it back because no one's there to build it you just have to keep surviving you go from living in whatever your your whatever you've built for yourself has gotten blown up by a bomb that's what I'm talking about in that mid time people are suffering we're not even just talking about just the war, just the bullets flying. That in and of itself is traumatizing enough. But in between, what do you get to do? You live a, a desperate life trying to find food and money and, and, and blankets or whatever for your family. You all know what it's like to care about someone in your family. Yes, exactly. Your life becomes entire, like Royal Fiddle says, your life becomes entirely filled with stress. Even in the off moments, you have no form of stress relief because it's all been destroyed. And you can't go anywhere because everywhere else is just like this too. Or you might not have the money to go there. What are you going to do? Leave your city and become homeless in another one? Maybe you have a, a nice shack. Maybe you have a place for your family to sleep that you wouldn't have if you went elsewhere. 
infectious and preventable diseases. Yeah, worms, uh, parasites, lice, things that make you miserable. Of the, city. the enemy is stuck in some places of the city, like their intelligence officers, police and governor's compound. But our Taliban are at every corner of the city. Now the Afghan military is trying a new strategy. After four days of fighting with its most elite special... Like, just look at the, the, look at the, deal, look at the, the scale of these explosions. This just blew up a building. A building turned into rubble instantly. Your forces and pounding the city with airstrikes, it is asking all people to evacuate the city. I'm leaving here. All the people have left. There's bombing from the air and the Taliban are on the ground. The army commander for Helmand made the request in a voice note. It was quickly spread among those still in Lashkargah. It will be very hard fighting. We will not leave the Taliban alive at any cost. I know it will be very hard for you, and it was a very hard decision for me too. I don't want to hurt my people. Please forgive us if you will get this place, and please evacuate as soon as possible. Analysts in Kabul say this strategy is flawed. Telling the population to go, not giving them an exact time frame, and then bombing um, uh, the hell out of the place and uh, and leaving the place. Um, um, as so, do you see what what's being discussed here? There's the we don't even know who's blowing up the buildings. This person is saying the Afghan security forces just said, "All right, everybody, get out!" And people were trying to get out, and they already started shooting bombs. The people of Afghanistan are trapped between a a sectarian warfare that we made worse that we made so much worse as a, as, a, as a terrible battleground in the same way that we saw pictures of kabul back in the 1990s if tens of thousands of people in Lashkargah heed the general's warning many will head three hours east to kandahar city the closest city and still held by the government 150,000 people have already been displaced there after fighting last month, but it took... Look, remember what I talked about in my other stream about how when infrastructure collapses, this is the stuff that your life becomes. If you don't have running water at your house, you have to send someone, you or someone in your family needs to go get water from somewhere. You can only live three days without water. If that and you start to feel real bad after one day without water. This is what we're talking about. This is what it looks like when infrastructure gets destroyed by war, when infrastructure gets neglected. Who is contested by the Taliban? The people fleeing their villages can't find a place to sleep, not even in tents. The situation is so bad. We want both the Taliban and the government to stop fighting. For God's sake, stop the fighting. In the western city of Herat, the situation is equally fluid. Special forces arrived to bolster the military and allied fighters after the Taliban cut off the city's airport last week. Even then, for a brief period, the Taliban got within three kilometers of the city center. Now the enemy is close to the city and we are very serious in defending the city. We hope we will push them back. It's our responsibility and we need to step up. The Taliban pressure on provincial capitals is growing every day. The move to evacuate Lashkargah is unprecedented and raises questions about who will support the thousands who may be displaced and what will become of the city when the battle for Lashkargah is over. Charlotte Ballas, Al Jazeera, Kabul. Okay, so now we've seen some of this with our own eyes. NATO's drawdown is continuing. NATO's exit from Afghanistan is continuing. An official of the military alliance has said NATO's resolute support mission continues and our drawdown is ongoing. The official told Reuters there is no military solution to the conflict and the Taliban must understand that they will never be recognized by the international community if they reject the political process and try to take the country by force. They must cease their attacks and take part in peace talks in good faith. Let's watch this one. Yeah, here we go. Silent has brought up something good here. Something to think about. Imagine a right-wing militia. Here, I'm going to read this uh, with me on the screen here so we're not looking at this real quick. Okay? 
something to think about. Imagine a right-wing militia is engaged in fighting with the National Guard in your town. While the fighting has been going, you've lost power. The grocery stores are struggling to get anything in. Shelves are empty. They've got limits on how many eggs you're allowed to buy. Do you wish for the National Guard to win, or do you wish for the fighting to end as soon as possible? Which one is it? What if you hate both of the factions that are fighting and all you want to do is feed your f family? What do you do in that situation? And don't think that, that that sort of story is forever far away from us. Keep in mind, we have active right-wing militias here. We have had ca capital takeovers that have failed here for now. The fight for Afghanistan is inching towards the capital, Kabul. The Taliban says its latest attacks on government leaders marks the start of a new campaign. Could this mean a return to full-scale war and have peace talks become pointless? This is Inside Story. Crikey says... Dima Mama, my brother believes that military intervention is warranted in such places as China due to the genocide going on. Do you have any advice or arguments how I can convince him that his thinking is delusional? I don't think that your brother is thinking realistically about what a a a war with China would look like. That would be the end of the that would be the end of the world as we know it. A war with China would be so violent and so ridiculous. There would be so much bloodshed. The problem that we have is that this is the problem that we have right now. We have enormous, we have states, we have nation states that are so powerful that you can't do, that nobody else in the world can actually do anything to, to, uh, to help the people inside. There's almost nothing you can do to help people inside of China except bear witness to their stories and hope that they can connect with other people to resist within their own country. And it sucks. It sucks that we have to, that we're so powerless all the time. But guess what? It happens here too. Keep in mind, children have been dying on our borders. Innocent children who have done nothing wrong have been dying in camps on our borders and no country in the world can do anything about it. This is why it is important to develop a meaningful critique of state power. I have a cousin who was non-military contractor in Afghanistan and married an Afghan woman. He's been trying to get her into the U.S. for literal years, and she's been turned away multiple times. I'm just glad she's not in Afghanistan right now. Me too. Don't forget the involuntary hysterectomies. By, it's by any definition a genocide. Yes, I know. I recognize that. But what I'm pr trying to point out is that we have numerous things going on in our country right now that other countries would see as monstrous and they can't do anything about it we are the only ones who can do anything about it do you understand that this is part of the reason why i personally am very critical of state power when you give unfathomable power to a state when a state has a level of dominance that nobody can possibly reach you do you know what usually happens a lot of people just die we learned about this with Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany is the like clearest cut example of this. How many people died before the war even got there? This is the problem. Well, this is the thing. So what's the alternative? How do you prevent this? We'll talk about that in the future. We, we're not talking about that right now. Right now, we're trying to understand the perspective first. Okay? Understand first. Jet... Je, challenge the questions later okay that's what we have to do we have to understand first let's continue oh we're not gonna watch this whole segment i just thought this was uh, i thought this was some clips here we go let's watch this one U.S. U.N. official extremely concerned over indiscriminate attacks. Martin Griffiths, the Undersecretary With Secur hundreds of excuse me, Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, has said in a statement, I am extremely concerned by the deteriorating situation in Afghanistan, where more than 1,000 people have been killed or injured due to indiscriminate attacks against civilians in Hilmand, Kandahar, and Herat provinces in the last month alone. There are grave concerns for women's survival and basic rights, he said, adding that 40 years of war and displacement combined by, combined by climate shocks and COVID-19 have left almost half of Afghanistan's population in need of emergency aid. Okay, 
Look at this. I want you to think about that. Almost half of the population is in need of emergency aid. You cannot imagine that. You can't. You can't. I can't. I can't imagine what it would be like to look outside and know that every other person that you see'd, see is in need of emergency aid. Not just aid. Not just general aid. They're not just lacking. They're going to die if they don't get what they need ASAP. And a lot of them are not going to get it. Thousands of Afghans being displaced by the Taliban. Look at this. And I want you to take a second and I want you to just admire the strength of these people. Okay? For just a second. I want you to just admire the strength of these people. These people are living in a desert, in tents, and they are still hugging each other, holding each other together. Okay? I want you to understand what it takes to live like that. I want you to imagine what happens if your building gets blown up and there's nowhere for you to go. There's no shelters. There's no nothing. Would you be able to do it? Would you? They are. These people are. These are humans just like you. These people aren't like... These aren't people who've never seen the internet or never seen a TV. These are all people who at one point in their life enjoyed modern comforts just like the rest of us. And not that it would matter if, if, if they hadn't, but just challenging that illusion. There's this illusion that a lot of Americans have in their mind that people elsewhere just have lived like this. No, they haven't. People in Afghanistan fucking played video games and had fun and did all kinds of stuff just like anybody else. They lived good lives. ...and offensive against government forces. UN aid workers are sounding the alarm on human rights abuses in Afghanistan as civilians, not to mention more than 1,000 UN employees, get caught in the crossfire. UNICEF said today it is outraged by a report that a 12-year-old boy from Shirin Tagab district in Faryab province suffered a brutal flogging by a member of an anti-government uh, group. Women in particular are at risk from violence and the loss of basic rights. A letter signed by prominent feminists and rights activists calls on the Security Council to authorize a peacekeeping force. Yep. Under Resolution 1325, which demands the protection. Retcon says, I realized a few years ago that as a kid, I thought the Taliban were just people that lived in caves and didn't have internet or anything because of how they are presented on the news. Yeah, no, that's not it. ISIS blew the lid off of this, by the way. The fact that ISIS was full of people who left lives where they were, you know, two years prior before joining ISIS, they were playing fucking Call of Duty on their goddamn Xbox, and then their house got blown up, and they said, fuck this, and they went and joined ISIS? That blew the lid off of the American imagination of what terrorists are. A good reminder that post-apocalypse stories assuming every, always assume that everyone turns on each other with, without order or BS. Most historical examples show people work to help each other get by. Yes, they do. Because mutual aid is a factor of evolution. Protection of women in armed conflict. Women are at risk for being women. And we know many of the things that are happening. I will not repeat the lit litany of what has happened to women during the advance. So uh, the primary thing is to get a ceasefire. Betty Reardon, who worked to get the resolution passed in 2000, says it also promises women a seat at the negotiating table. The protection of women in armed conflict is not just some lofty UN ideal. It was enshrined in international law right here by the UN Security Council, which is under increasing pressure to help stabilize the situation in Afghanistan. But the council is unlikely to authorize a peacekeeping force, given that any mission would have to be approved by the five permanent members who all have veto power. There is now... Uh-oh a real danger of spread of extremism and terrorism in countries surrounding Afghanistan. There's no doubt about that. Kai Aida is a former UN envoy for the region. He says with the withdrawal of US forces, Let, the we'll Taliban take a look at this. needs Perfect. extra incentive to negotiate. He's calling on the Secretary General to appoint and the Security Council to get behind a single UN appointed mediator for peace talks. It has been said for a long time that it should be Afghan-led Afghan own negotiations well, Thank you for that, that doesn't work. We'll know? bring this up in just a you second. You have to put somebody else in charge here. 
The council is meeting on Friday to discuss the situation, but civil society groups say it's action, not dialogue, Afghans need the most. Kristen Salumi, Al Jazeera. Look, look, at, look, at, look at what these people are doing to stay every day. These people are just sitting here with their little waters, talking with each other, making things together, trying to take care of one another. This, this war has been imposed on these people. These are people trying to live their lives, trying to live fulfilling lives. And war has led them to live like, th like to have to live like this, to have to live in a way where they can't build anything because it might be undermined the next day. The United Nations. Okay, I wanna show you something. I was just sent something really cool. Okay, I was just sent something very, very cool. Okay, here we go. All right, look at this. This is photos, historical photos from Afghanistan that were published by The Atlantic, okay? 35 photos, okay? A picture taken in 1962 at the, at the Faculty of Medicine in Kabul, two Afghan medicine students listening to their professors as they examined plaster casts of a body part. Here, this is the 60s, 62. Here we go, look at this. Men stroll past roadside vendors as, pa as a painted truck makes, it way makes its way through Kabul or Kabul in 1961. Look at this. This is just your everyday market. We have one of these just like it, just like this in Seattle. Nineteen sixty-six government printing plant, which housed the Kabul Times, a news place. Most of its machinery was f furnished by West Germany. Architecture in Kabul, seen in May 1968. 1961. This, these cities are identical to American cities at the time. Afghan boys, men, some in bare feet, shop at a marketplace in Kabul in 1964. Look at these little dapper guys. Look at these little dapper dudes. Here we have a, a, a parade for Eisenhower. Look at everybody's, everybody's just come to see. People in traditional wear, people tossing confetti. Here's an air, an airfield. Look at this beautiful shop. Do you know how hard it is to maintain a shop like this when you're in war? You can't. It won't happen. It will fall apart. It will be looted. These things don't exist anymore. I'm sure they do some places, but in many places they've been destroyed. Here are just some kids. Here's a mechanic shop in 1960. Or sorry, here's a. Which one is this one from? An Afghan worker checks a Russian made truck. This was in 1992. Look, it's just a big machinery thing. Here you go, people working. Like I said, these are places just like anywhere else. These are places, you know, some of the architecture's different. Some of it's not super great. But look, this is just people living their normal lives. And now we see what it's led to. People going to the park. People working on various projects. These are all it from the 60s to the 90s. Before the war began in full in the 70s. Pomegranates. Plenty. All of this is before the full-on war. Okay? Omicron, it wasn't just the Taliban. Have you ever looked at the population charts? In Afghanistan, the population growth that happened in the war that started in the 70s, I've, I've looked it up on this stream before. It's incredibly destructive. Here we go again. Let's continue. Fighting displaces hundreds of Afghan families. Hundreds of families from Takar and Kunduz have had to leave their homes and settle in a safe place in Kabul. 
the photo 28 is especially striking to me. That could be any city in Southern California. If I didn't tell you it was Kabul, you'd never guess. True. True. We don't know anyone here to help us, and we don't have any money. We even forgot to bring our national ID cards. We walked away with slippers. We didn't have a chance to put on our shoes. Raising the city of Lashkar in a bid to control it, Taliban fighters filmed this on Friday morning in the central market. Omicron. No one on earth is doubting that the Taliban is misogynistic. Obviously, the Taliban is a far-right, hyper-traditionalist organization. Obviously, no one is doubting that. What we're talking about right now is we're not fucking piddling back and forth over factionalism. What we're talking about is individuals, the experience of people. This is Lashkargar Bazaar. The enemy have- Look, this is the bazaar. This is what I was just talking about. Remember how I just talked about it is impossible to keep a store that looks like that one we just looked at? Look, these are overturned tables. That's fruit being stomped on the ground. Bombarded the space and destroyed the lives of innocent people. The Taliban says this was the result of heavy airstrikes in the night and that it's not the first civilian area to be targeted in Lashkargar. U.S. and Afghan airstrikes have pounded the city for nearly a week now. Do you hear that? U.S. and Afghan government airstrikes have been blowing up the city. It's not... Yes, we're, we're not sitting here arguing about the factions. In the struggle to try and fight the Taliban, in the struggle of the Taliban to fight the United States, every other person is caught in the middle. And they're blowing up civilian structures. They're, it's, it's a deliberate tactic. If you go look into U.S. war tactics in the Middle East, they blow up key infrastructure so that the Taliban can't use it. But it also destroys it for everyone else. And everything has to be rebuilt from the ground up if it can ever be rebuilt. Helmand's army commander asked residents to leave on Tuesday to avoid civilian casualties. The government says the Taliban is relying on human shields and looting people's shops and homes for food and weapons. <laughs> on the ground, these Afghan special forces march into battle, chanting, we will punish them and long live Afghanistan. For a week, they have arrived in waves. It is urban warfare, fighting the Taliban street by street. The man who filmed these videos told us his family cannot leave their home because there is constant fighting on his street. After one week stuck inside, so they are running low on food and his home is shaking with constant airstrikes. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. This is somebody's garden right here on the screen. This is a garden. This is somebody has put love into these trees, has been growing this, and they've had to they, they've had to leave it. This might not even exist anymore. This was from six, seven days ago. This this garden may not exist anymore. Uh, we we're worried and now we're extremely worried. We know that um, a, big, a big chunk of the population has moved out of town. Uh, but we don't know exactly where they are, and we don't have right now the capacity to reach to them. For those who can escape, they travel on dangerous roads, taking with them all they can pack. They look for places free of fighting, but every day those areas shrink. I want you to imagine one more thing, okay? Real quick. I just want you to imagine another thing, okay? I want you to imagine yourself going... Uh, how, your, 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 your area becomes very dangerous, too dangerous to live in. You know, maybe you've got a dog, maybe you've got a girlfriend or a boyfriend that you love or a vet or a, or a joy friend that you love. And thank you very, very much. A companion, many companions, maybe a whole family. Um, yeah, go for it. Okay. 
and then I got to focus on this. Um, just take it with you, okay? So I want you to imagine that, and then I want you to imagine you somehow manage to get your stuff together into your car. You get your essentials. Maybe you, you know, pack your, your IDs, your animal, and some supplies, food, drink, some books that are important to you, some keepsakes that are important to you from your past, and you leave everything else. You get all that into your car, and then you go to leave, and on your way to a place that you think is safe, you get stopped by armed guards. And you don't know who those armed guards represent. They could be the Taliban. They could be the Afghan forces. They could be US. They could be a completely, they could be a local uh, crime syndicate. You don't know. Maybe they extort you. Maybe they take your money. Maybe they say they do other horrible things to you and your family. You're not getting through to that safe place unless you do what they tell you. And that is what we've seen over and over and over again is checkpoints full of armed individuals checking every car. I left my home. I'm going to Khakris. Here there is always war. I'm leaving because of war, nothing else. Listen to that. I'm leaving because of war and nothing else. They are f they're fleeing because they want to survive. Oh, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. I forgot to put the screen up. I got it. I got you. Hold on. We'll go back. Here we go. I'm sorry about that. Chris, here there is always war. I'm leaving because of war, nothing else. UNICEF says 360,000 people have been forced to flee their homes in the last week. Half of them are children. I'm sorry. Can we get that number again? Last week. Half of death says 360,000 people. 360,000 people. The entire, the more than the population of Tacoma. And 150,000 of those are children. People have been forced to flee their homes in the last week. Half of them are children. I left my home and won't return until it gets more secure or until there is peace. May there be an end to the conflict. Okay, to address a question in chat, Omicron says, this is why I'm uncomfortable about photos in the 90s being used to suggest things were okay there then. That was not what I was saying. What I was showing is that that even that people who you're seeing in these photos lived a modern life. They lived a life just like you and I would live. They, they, these people have, the people of Afghanistan have lived a life just like you and I. They, at one point in time, probably believed just like you and I do that tomorrow they're going to wake up and do their job or do their passion or see their loved ones and then it's gone. As they head towards Kandahar city, the sounds of war chase them. The highway littered with reminders there is no safe passage. While both the government and Taliban try to assert their control over the places the Afghan people call home. Charlotte Ballas, Al Jazeera, Kabul. Okay. Now. At least 27 killed, children killed. 136. This was as of seven days ago. Okay. Let's take a look at this. Okay. Al Jazeera, are they okay as a news source? Uh, well, we just had a media literacy segment. Al Jazeera does do some very good reporting, but like all media sources, they all have their bi biases. Al Jazeera US is a little bit worse than Al Jazeera's overseas coverage in general, just because uh, Al Jazeera uh, Al Jazeera US um, does a lot of, uh, it, because of the media environment here, Al Jazeera US does a lot of opinion and a lot of special productions, okay? They're decent. Just keep an eye that there are different sections, okay? This is an article called Feminationalism, White Savior Feminism in Afghanistan, okay? And I want to read this because this is a slightly different perspective, and we're going to discuss what we think about this, okay? Western feminists often discuss and offer solutions for the position of women in Afghanistan. However, as Mizuna Ebdikar writes, these viewpoints are often stripped of the context of decades of military devastation and silence the voices of Afghan women who are fighting for change. Okay? 
Cheryl Bernard recently published an article comparing the current plight of Afghan women to women in Western civilization. In Bernard's views, Afghans have been organically resistant to the imported American ideas and modernity. She advises Afghan women to learn to fight for their own rights and, and to ally with the Taliban, an insurgency group with the worst track record on women's rights, in order to stand against Afghan anti-woman traditions. This civilizational, this civilizational grandiloquence, pitying non-Western women because we in the West are more civilized and rational, is, set, is championed by white feminists who suffer from a white savior complex. This understanding assumes that gender relations and women's rights are more advanced in the West and need to be imparted on non-Western women as agent, agentless objects of unchanging patriarchal systems. It also detracts attention from the discrimination to which West, women in Western Europe and North America are subject. Sarah R. Ferris has coined the term feminationalism to describe how right-wing nationalists and neoliberals instrumentalize women's rights to advocate to advance their anti-Islam and anti-immigration campaigns in Europe. Feminationalists include feminist theorists and policymakers or femocrats who frame Islam as being a wholly misogynistic religion and culture. In a similar way, Bernard takes pride in having worked on Afghan women's rights for over 20 years while publishing on Euro, on Euro Jihad or how Afghan refugees and Western Europe are, are criminals or, and rapists. Okay. Concerns about Afghan women have been at the forefront of many discussions about the American military intervention and occupation of Afghanistan since 2001. This came after a long silence following the USSR withdrawal from which the United States benefited and at a time when Afghanistan witnessed a civil war, 1992 through 1994, and intense fighting during the re Taliban regime between 1996 and 2001. After 2001... Uh, humanitarian institutions, Euro-American media organizations, and academics have promoted the rhetoric that women living in Afghanistan need to be li liberated from their religion, their culture, and their oppressive men as part of a broader civilizing mission. This comes with little to no attention to the political and historical reasons behind the current conditions under which women live. The 1964 Constitution, on which the current Constitution relies, recognized that all Afghans, without discrimination or preference, have equal rights and obligations before the law. This constitution guaranteed women dignity, compulsory education, and freedom to work. Even if there was dissent from more conservative-minded groups, Afghan society reconciled with women's participation in the workplace and academic ex institutions from the 1960s onward. Antifa Alex, thank you very much for the, uh, the Tier 3 sub. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay? There is a long history of women fighting for their rights in Afghanistan. As a response to the communist, communist coup in 1978, followed by the Soviet invasion in 1979, various underground women's groups undermined the USSR-backed government. Women students took part in massive anti-government demonstration in Kabul, where, there, where many were arrested and some were killed. Meanwhile, women in rural areas actively supported the resistance against the USSR and the USSR-backed government. Even during the years dominated by the draconian Taliban regime, Afghan women risked their lives to open underground schools for girls at a time when schools and universities were made inaccessible to female students and teachers. But even when we look past the most recognized forms of resistance in which Afghan women have engaged, that is, those forms that are politically intelligible within Western traditions, we can better understand the lessons that leading feminist scholars such as Leela Abu Lugad and Saba Mahmud have taught us, that women are able to exercise their agency even within patriarchal oppressive systems. Afghan women are not waiting to have a people from a different culture far away feel sorry for us and send their soldiers and money to lift us out of oppression, quote unquote. Afghan women have exerted and still use their agency despite the insurmountable hardships that they face every single day. So-called feminists such as Bernard ruminate on how aid money or job placements have not empowered Afghan women while disregarding the most crucial element of their lived experiences. Afghan women have lived in conditions of war, occupation, and militarization over the past four decades, creating and sustaining the circumstances under which freedoms of all kind are limited. Jill Bilod's ethnography in Kabul demonstrates how women in post-2001 Afghanistan have dealt with the norms of decades of war, destitution, and displacement have made more rigid. So how can we expect Afghan women's fight for their rights to live in a just, equal, and safe society to mirror the fight of women in, living in Western Europe and the United States? Bernard's article comes at a time when her husband, Zalmay Khalizad, the official representative of the U.S. United States and Afghanistan is stepping over the Afghanistan government to negotiate 
a peace deal with the Taliban in Qatar for a fast-track U.S. withdrawal, which we now see what has happened. Bernard's husband is negotiating with the same Taliban that have vindicated America's longest war, expended American lives and money, and caused the death and displacement of millions. Currently, the very same people who advocated for military op occupation in Afghanistan and justified it by claiming to, save, to be saving Afghan women are telling us that the Taliban are not so bad. And that at the same time, that although they came to Afghanistan to rid the country of the Taliban, they're instead negotiating with them and compromising the lives of the same women that they supposedly are trying to save. Okay? Now, we can keep going on this. Oh, sorry, I should re- I, I, I just realized I missed the last paragraph. Afghan women are faced with multi-layered challenges, and to draw an equivalence with any other context in terms of women's struggles is not only ill-informed, but profoundly unfeminist. If so-called feminists, such as B Bernard, Bush, or Trump, are concerned about the predicament of Afghan women, they should push for a re-evaluation of American foreign policy. Imperialist wars have culminated the destruction of Afghanistan since 1979, creating the very conditions, very dire conditions in which Afghan women now live. Unwanted saviors should check their white privilege, listen, recognize, and not undermine the everyday struggles of Afghan women. Okay? So this is a pretty even-handed article, okay? I really wanted to read this one because it talks about something very real that we've seen, which is that it's very easy to what we do what we call virtue signal over all kinds of issues like this, especially when it comes to women and children. We all know how that goes, right? We all know how people are willing to use women and children as a, an excuse for many things. And as it turns out, for most of the women in Afghanistan, um, and, and as it turns out, for the, women, for the women in Afghanistan, neither side is doing good for them. The Taliban is swooping in saying, we must, we must impose this way of life so that we can return to, uh, to a, a, so we can restore an, an Isla a, a hyper-Islamic foundation for this country um, that, that, that is, uh, you know, that is, you know, their stated goals. And then the United States, Russia, China, all of these other countries all come in and say, oh, we're going to save you. We're here to save you. We're here to save you is what we're here to do. But... What do we find out? There are strings attached to all of these. Yeah, let us liberate you against your will, no matter how many of you die in the process. And keep in mind that every single force that's intervening in Afghanistan, whether it's the Taliban, whether it's China, whether it's Russia, whether it's the United States, all of them are trying to do so in the name of fixing the country. But all of them, their answer is more bombs. Yeah, I'm bombing your hospitals because I'm helping. So let's take a look at what someone who we generally like has to say about this, okay? Look, you United States Representative Ilan Omar. Ilan Omar released a statement this morning. No, no, yes, this morning. This was a statement that was released this morning. Let's listen it. Let's let's read this statement and let's see what conclusions we can come to, okay? Like many of us, I have watched the immense human tragedy in Afghanistan in horror. My heart goes out to the Afghan people, especially the many Afghans who risked their lives for a safer, freer Afghanistan, as well as, the, the, as, well as that of the countless Americans who served in this conflict, thousands of whom made the ultimate sacrifice. Now, I don't like this wording here. Countless Americans who served in this conflict, thousands of whom made the ultimate sacrifice. For what? The ultimate sacrifice for what? Who, what were they sacrificing for? The state told them to go there. They had to go there to fight and die. They did. That's what happens. You sign a contract with the military. You don't get to have a say in whether the fight was good or bad. It has also for me been personally painful. I know what it's like to be a child, the child in the family scrambling for safety in a war-torn country. I also know intimately the difference between making it out and not making it out. As with so many moments in this two decade long conflict, I have not been able to read the news without seeing myself and my family many years ago, desperately fleeing imminent violence in Somalia. 
Of course, the tragedy did not begin in the last couple of weeks. The hard truth about America's longest war is that for 20 years, we made promises we couldn't keep. The simple fact is that prolonging a war indefinitely would, would not have delivered a stable, peaceful Afghanistan. I agree with President Biden. An endless military occupation of Afghanistan was unacceptable. War and conflict never produce peace and stability. Violence and militarism, even when cloaked in the language of humanitarianism, are fundamentally at odds with human flourishing and opportunity. Violence only produces trauma, trauma that can turn into anger, vengefulness, and a continued silent cycle of violence. That must be a lesson we deal with in conflicts around the world. There will be plenty of time for confronting the fundamental failures of our Afghanistan policy over the course of many decades and four presidencies. I hope we genuinely confront them and reckon with them rather than doubling down on obsolete talking points from 20 years ago that failed to account for the thousands of American lives cost and trillion plus dollars spent. And the destruction wreaked on Afghanistan. I hope we will learn from this as painful as it is. In the meantime, the urgency of the movement before us now demands we marshal an international coalition to evacuate every Afghan citizen who is fleeing for their lives. This is an American responsibility, and it is a NATO responsibility. It is also a human responsibility. We must hold the airport in Kabul and lead a multinational airlift operation. We have the capacity. We must simply find the will to get them out. There will also be Afghan human rights activists, women, and civil society members who choose to stay. We have an obligation to them too. The president has been clear that the end of the war does not mean the end of our commitment to the Afghan people. We must begin to prove that with this airlift operation. And I look forward to working with him to ensure that when the headlines and emotions of this deeply painful moment subside, we are still focused on the people to whom we owe an enormous amount. All in all, I think this is a fine statement. I think that she's right to say that we owe a lot to the people of Afghanistan. Obviously, this is from a U.S. representative. So there is a lot of bias still in this towards the United States, talking about soldiers and the United States military as making sacrifices. Notice that we never, we never stopped spending on weapons, but we certainly hesitate to spend on airlifting operations. We hesitate to spend on rebuilding infrastructure. We hesitate to spend on uh, giving money directly to the people who actually need it. We spend lot trillions on bombs, trillions on tanks, trillions on guns, trillions on training soldiers to kill people, trillions on establishing our diplomats in their spaces to control the direction of their government. And yet, that is always taken as for granted. Uh, the, our military spending, which predominantly goes to fucking bombs, to destroying things. Not to rebuilding, not to helping another country. Let's help evacuate everyone we can. We owe it to them. Okay. But I want you to think about this real quick. I want you to think about this real quick. What we can all imagine would be a, a pretty good, like, uh, you know, a pretty good solution would be to fully support what, 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 oh, what Ilan Omar is advocating for here, a giant airlifting operation, is not a solution, okay? That's not a solution. It's important. I think we should do it. I think that we should be willing to take in as many refugees as exist. And I mean that. I genuinely believe that if we really, if we really, really, really wanted to put this, um, to put our, any, even a drop of our money where our mouth is, we would support bringing every last refugee that we can possibly manage to a safe place, whether it's here in the United States, whether it's in one of our allied nations that is safe. I, I believe that would be fantastic. But I, I want you to realize, just real quick, what that is that what you're essentially saying is we have been involved in your country for 20 years we have blown up your critical a a infrastructure we have failed to defeat the people who were uh, who we called the threat and now all that we can do is take you out of there all that we can do is hope that you flee to us and then go from there isn't that absurd that the only solution we can offer after all of this time, after all of this fighting, after all of these explosions, 
after all of this media cycle, 20 years of discussion about Afghanistan, all that we can do is say, maybe we'll give you a flight out. Maybe. And we're not even doing that yet. We destroyed their home. We destroyed it. And it's not, you can't just blame the Taliban because yes, while the Taliban is a terrible group, remember, we supported the Taliban. And that's hard to deal with. We have laid the groundwork again and again and again. We talk about destabilization. That is what America does. America goes into places and destabilizes them. They undermine inconvenient regimes. They make it so that no regime can take control. And what that does to the people is it means that they exist in a blasted wasteland and every time they build something up, it gets knocked down. Every single time. Silent says, if any fiscal conservatives are going to mask their racism by claiming it's an economic burden to take them in, many of these people are college educated and are fleeing the Taliban because they supported the government. Not that the lack of economical skills should ever be used in not taking refugees. Yes. These are humans. These are humans who really, really want to build things. We do banana republics. Yeah, we do. We go in, we upset or, or undermine the currently existing government. Even a lot of times those governments have horrible problems. You know me. I'm fucking critical of all government. You know this. I'm critical of all forms of governance. <clears throat> A banana republic, uh, okay, and for those who don't know what the term banana republic means, a banana republic is basically a, uh, a puppet, a puppet government that is set up because of an economic interest. It's called a banana republic because previously it was done over bananas. Bananas were incredibly, incredibly valuable. Bananas and sugar and, and coffee and a couple of other, um, crops, like cash crops, were very valuable. And so the U.S. would go in, undermine the existing government, and set up a republic that was staffed by American American favorable politicians. So it's called, yeah. Look up the history of Chiquita, Chiquita Banana. Yes. These are, this is public, by the way, this is a matter of public record. This is not like conspiracy stuff. This is a matter of public ref record. The United States is admitted to this. We've made it an, uh, Royal Fiddle says, we've made it an institution under the pretense that America is being the best, of America being so good that we have to spread our goodness to police the world. Here are the results of the fucking spread. Death, decay, bombed out countries. Yes, and what people, what, what the article that we just read a few minutes ago about feminism was talking about is that there were valid, there were valid feminist movements. There were homegrown feminist movements. There were Islamic feminist movements that were rising up and that can't operate because the infrastructure is destroyed. I want you to think about that. What do you think your job is? If you, if you're, if you are reduced to living a life of basic sustenance, what do you think your job is going to be if you're a woman? It's to take care of children. It's to make food so that the guys can go fight, so that the guys can go lift heavy objects. We... We fall back on these outdated modes of society because there is no, because there's no stability. You're living a life of sustenance. You can't build when you're living a life of base sustenance. It Yes, exactly. Royal Fiddle, it returns to the domestic servitude of the woman. Yes, because remember that at the end of the day, these people still have to exist in a greater capitalist context. Ugly Pie says, this war has been happening since I was three years old. I can't imagine a young woman just like me living their entire life under these conditions. You can't, yeah, and guess what they have? They have and they fought and they've built things, things that are now getting blown up. And I want you to take, I want us to take a moment to, to just, um, real quick, to just have a, a, a check. Remember how we talked about everybody, all those videos we watched just a couple minutes ago of people fleeing? The city that they fled to just fell to the Taliban yesterday. All of those people got up and fled to the capital only to have the capital also fall. There is nowhere for them to run. And America is not airlifting people out. We're not we are not responding to this refugee crisis. 
Canada is taking like 20,000 people, but just from one city, there was 300,000 people displaced. Many of those people fled to Kabul, where they now have to flee again. Capo says, I'm forever haunted by one line from Dan Olson's video on the wall. Soldiers sent to war don't die for their country. They just die. Yes, that is true. I talked about this in my conversation with Connor Points about nationalism and about how uh, people chain themselves to an invisible construct, an invisible construct that doesn't have a solid form. The state, the government, the nation. People chain themselves to this and they say, I'm dying for my nation. But people who went and died in Afghanistan, they don't even have this. this the government isn't even the same. Now it's Biden. And, and four years from now, it might be somebody else. No one ever won a war by dying for their country. They win by making some other poor bastard die for their country. George Patton. That's 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 uh, that's that quote hits hard. Nobody dies for a country. Nobody dies for a nation. Can you talk a bit about how and why all of this started in the first place? I'm a Zoomer, so all of this has been going on since I was like three. I'm not really sure about the history. You know, I would like to do a full history on this, but again, I'm not a foreign policy extra expert, but I can give you a rough timeline, okay? So, in the 70s, Russia went to war in Afghanistan, and it was a very similar war to the one that we've been waging for the last 20 years, a proxy war. Uh, it was very secretive, and um, the Russians literally, it was so secretive that the Russians literally wouldn't tell family members where where their soldier, where their family members died. So soldiers would come back in a casket, and they would not be allowed to know where or why they died, because this was being kept secret, a proxy war by Russia. Russia did so much damage in Afghanistan that you can actually look at the charts. Like, look, you can actually go look at the population charts. Let me show you. Okay? Let's see if we can get the chart here. Where's the chart? Okay? I want you to, I want you to look at this, okay? Look at this. Annual percentage change. Okay, ready? Watch, watch, ready? Ready? Right around here is where the war in Afghanistan with the Russians begins. Boop. Look at that. Look at that dip. You can see it on a population chart. How many Afghanistan, how many Afghans died when Russia began their proxy war in Afghanistan? Look at this. You can fucking see it. And we're, it's starting to go down again. We're starting to see it again. That's how intense it was, okay? So, after that happened, a number of, of, of factions appeared in Afghanistan. One of these factions that gained a lot of power is the extreme far-right group called the Taliban. And the Taliban is fighting against... Um, uh, Russia, at one point, we fucking... I mean, everyone's seen the... Uh, uh, hold on. <clears throat> uh, let's see here. So, hold on a second. Let me show you this. We've all seen this one, right? Everybody's seen this meme? Hold on. Let's see right here. Look at this. Hold on. Watch this. Ready? Everybody's seen this one from fucking Rambo? Rambo 3? This film is dedicated to the brave Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. These were the Taliban. American media was celebrating the Taliban because the Taliban were fighting the Russia, Russians at the time. This is from Rambo fucking 3. This is how America has treated this. Oh boy, we got breaking news. Okay, we have some breaking news. Joe Biden, I have authorized 6,000 U.S. troops to deploy to Afghanistan to assist in the departure of U.S. and allied civilian personnel from Afghanistan and to evacuate our Afghan allies and vulnerable Afghans to safety outside the country. 
the Taliban, the Taliban and the Mujahideen are two different groups. I don't believe they are. I don't believe they are. Mujahideen just refers to uh, guerrilla fighters. At the time, the Mujahideen fighters would have been the uh, Taliban, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, they turned around and fought the Taliban? They, the Taliban was created by ex-Mujahideen. This is what I'm talking about. I would love to do a full history, Mama. I'm just giving you the general arc. Okay? I'm just giving you the general arc. Okay? So that's where we're at right now. This just happened. Six more, 6,000 troops have redeployed into Afghanistan. Okay? Our current military mission will be short in time and focused in its objectives. Get our people and our allies to safety as quickly as possible. Once we have completed this mission, we will conclude our military withdrawal. We will end America's longest war. We will end America's longest war with a, with a, with a loss, by the way, just so that we can be clear with a loss. Let me show you another real quick article, okay? We're gonna, I'm going to give you a little blast from the past that will seal home what I'm talking about, okay? Okay? Let me just show you this, okay? I just want to I just want to show you this. And then I'll give you my 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 dumb dumb's take on it, okay? This is an article from from the Guardian. And this was from October 2001. Okay? Look at this. Sunday 14th Sunday, October 14th, 2001. Ready? Bush rejects Taliban offer to hand bin Laden over. President George Bush rejected as non-negotiable an offer by the Taliban to discuss turning over Osama bin Laden if the United States ended the bombing in Afghanistan. Returning to the White House after a weekend at Camp David, the president said the bombing would not stop unless the ruling Taliban turn bin Laden over, turn over his court cohorts, and turn any hostages they hold over. He added, there's no need to discuss innocence or guilt. We know he's guilty. In Jal Jalalabad, Deputy Prime Minister Haj Abdul Kabir, the third most powerful figure in the ruling Taliban regime, told reporters that Taliban would require evidence that bin Laden was behind the September 11th terrorist attacks in the U.S., but added, we would be ready to hand him over to a third country. <clears throat> The offer came a day after the Taliban supreme leader rebuffed Bush's second chance for the Islamic militia to surrender bin Laden to the U.S. Taliban was ready to discuss bin Laden handover if bombing halts. The Taliban would be ready to discuss handing it over to a neutral country if they halted bombing in Afghanistan. Large explosions caused by American bombs and missiles have been reported to the south and east of the Afghan capital of Kabul this evening. The sky above the city has filled with tracer fire from Taliban anti-aircraft guns once again. Before the start of the, the air campaign, the Taliban had demanded evidence of bin Laden's involvement in the attack and had offered to try him before an Islamic court inside of Afghanistan, proposals that the U.S. promptly rejected. Al-Qaeda warned it against an admission of guilt. Threats of new terrorist strikes against Britain and the U.S. from Osama bin Laden's group Al-Qaeda group amount to an admission of guilt for September 11th. Mr. Prescott, speaking while on a diplomatic mission in Moscow, argued the latest statement strongly suggested bin Laden's cul culpability, etc., etc. As rage grew over U.S.-led airstrikes in Afghanistan, one military leader exhorted followers to set Shabazz Air Pace in Jakabad on fire at any cost, and another called on Pakistan's generals to overthrow the country's military ruler. UN Commissioner warns of Afghan starvation threat. United Nations Human Rights Commissioner Mary Robinson has called for a pause in the U.S.-led bombing of Afghanistan to allow food aid into the country and to prevent a Rwandan-style humanitarian disaster. A humanitarian disaster. This is from 20 years ago, almost to the date. 
October 14th, 2001. Okay? I just want you to be, uh, I just want you to be, you know, aware that this was being talked about 20 years ago. People were warning of this 20 years ago. We have been bombing a country for 20 years. The people who live there have, cannot build anything for themselves. And this is what we do. We bomb countries. We make them dependent. We make them unstable. So we can take whatever the fuck we want and then leave. And what's the cost? Who pays the price? It's not the US. I mean, we pay a lot of money for the war stuff, but that's very lucrative. That's very lucrative for our corporations. It's very lucrative for us to get access to everything that Afghanistan has to offer. It's very lucrative for us to be able to put the hurt on countries that we're, um, that we're opposed to. The U.S. literally knew there was a danger of a protracted war. Everyone knew. We, already see, we had already seen it in the 70s. We already knew that Afghanistan was the graveyard of empires that the biggest empires in the world could not win in Afghanistan. And here we are 20 years later again in the exact same position. We have, we have now watched the capital fall again to the Taliban. We have, our actions, our bombing has empowered the Taliban. I want you to think about something, okay? Real quick. Put yourself in the position Real quick, okay? I want you to just take a minute and I want you to put yourself in the shoes of someone whose life, who spent their entire life having everything that they know destroyed and taken out from under them again and again and again. Maybe you're apolitical. Apolitical. Maybe you're like, you know, you just want to live. You just want to fucking grill, okay? You just want to take care of your kids, okay? Maybe that would be... Uh, maybe that's your goal. Maybe you don't have any particular leanings. And you are, your town gets, your town hospital, your community center, your internet infrastructure gets blown up by an American or a NATO or an American ally bomb. And then this Taliban guy comes up to you and says, hey, don't you motherfucking hate these guys? Don't you see that they've been blowing us up? The same, these same people, these Westerners, have been blowing us up for the last 40 years, for the last 50 years. You've never lived a day of peace because of these motherfuckers. And then you start to get the idea, wow, maybe these guys have the right answer. That's how these extreme, these disgusting far-right extremist groups win people over. You, if you've had everything that you love, if, what if your kid got killed by an American bomb? What if your kid got killed by a bomb shot by the American-backed Afghan government? Do you think you're going to be very favorable to working with them? It's, yeah, it's a, it's a right-wing super pipeline. Super pipeline. And now I want you to imagine yourself in a different position. Imagine you're a kid or, or, or a woman and your dad signs up with the Taliban and all of a sudden the Taliban takes over your village and previously you were living a life maybe you were studying at school maybe you had dreams of things you wanted to do with your life of things you wanted to learn and now your town belongs to the to the Taliban a far-right hyper patriarchal militia and there's no one you can turn to because the Americans don't care about you the Russians certainly don't care about you the Afghanistan security forces are just trying to not get killed by the Taliban. What are you supposed to do? <clears throat> it's tough. So we've talked about a lot. I've given you the basic idea. I've shown you some of the stuff that I've that I've seen here. Um, we've talked about the statement that just came from Biden. It looks like we're putting more troops in.
Okay. Now I'm going to read another little, we're going to read a little thread together, okay? We're going to read this and then I'm going to give my take, okay? I know you've all been waiting for my take, okay? This is from ba Brad Simpson, okay? I was a radio producer for Democracy Now! on September 11th, 2001, and in the months afterwards. We all like, we love, you know, we, we love Democracy Now! here. I think that's a fucking fantastic show. I don't agree with everything, but they do great journalism, okay? Okay? I had a unique vantage point to witness the anti-war movement against the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. There was a massive anti-war movement, decentralized, local, and ultimately ignored by the media. Shortly after 9-11, we had Rita Lazar on the show. She lost her brother in the Twin Towers. She talked about her opposition to killing innocent Afghan civilians as revenge for the murder of in innocent U.S. civilians. There were many, many Rita Lazars. One morning, we had Colleen Stevens on. She lived in suburban CT, and her, su her husband had died on 9-11. She held a candlelight vigil to protest the prospects of war against Afghanistan, and 5,000 people showed up to support it. It merited one line in a single Associated Press report. There were more Colleen's. We set up a voice mailbox at the show and asked people to leave messages describing what they were doing in their cities and towns. At first it was a trickle, a few vigils daily here and there, then dozens. Then they overwhelmed us every single day for weeks. I marched with maybe 10,000 people in New York City in October, shortly before the U.S. invasion. We knew the U.S. would invade. Most folks who opposed the war had no idea that there had been hundreds of protests around the country since 9-11. Most Americans still have no idea. Millions, tens of millions of Americans opposed using the pain of 9-11 to murder more innocent people in Afghanistan. Hundreds of thousands, probably more, came to the streets opposing war. These protests were completely ignored by the media, but they happened. I saw it. I had a unique vantage point. Democracy Now! is the only media outlet in the U.S. giving voice to anti-war Americans, but they were everywhere. Under the media radar screen, in the hundreds of towns and cities, the movement largely disappeared once the war started, but it was there. Here's some pictures from NYC on 2001. Our grief is not a cry for war. Our grief is not a cry for war. Our grief is not a cry for war. Two thousand one, everybody. The twenty second of September, two thousand one, Union Square, noon. Capo says, not disagreeing that it's a loss, but what would have even constituted a win at this point? There wasn't one. There isn't a win. America doesn't win or lose wars anymore. What America does is destabilizes and makes money off of war. It's war profiteering. That's what America does now. We're, we call ourselves world police. We're not doing any of that. Uh, uh, w uh, countries are chosen for their strategic and economic value to the United States. A, a reason for going in is invented or found, whether it's something that actually exists or whether it's one that ends up being created, is is justified, and then we go in and we fuck the place up and we benefit from it. The war is America's victory. And that's what I want people to realize. That that and I want you to notice there were a lot of people who opposed the war in Afghanistan. But you know who didn't? The media. The media delivered. This is where the manufacturing of consent comes in. The media only listened, only reported on the people who were supporting the war. The people who had a lot to make off of it. Not only does the media have a lot to make off of war, because wartime always means people are watching the news. But also, it's not even, you don't even have to go that far. They just only talk to American state sources. They talk to intelligence people. They talk to the, to the president who's deciding to do the war. They talk to the representatives who are deciding to do the war. Lockheed Martin 
Hal, what, what's it called? Halliburton? Is that the other one? I always get their name wrong. These enormous military industrial companies that produce weapons, that develop weapons, that make money contracting. Like, I wish that I could talk to you about the money that contracting has done. Do you know what happens? Listen to this. This is where it gets really fucked up, okay? Americans will blow up infrastructure and then they will allow an American company to offer to fix the infrastructure for a price. Either it will be debt that the new government will owe or it will have to be paid directly. This inflates the stock prices of those, the, of those um, companies that are doing the contracting. Sometimes the contractors never even deliver. Sometimes the infrastructure they build is shit. Sometimes they just take the money and run. It's got to qualify as a scam. What are you, how are you, who are you going to tell? Who are you going to tell? Who can challenge it? It doesn't matter if it's a scam. Who are you going to tell? Your, your, your infrastructure's blown up. Your country is full of soldiers. Who are you going to tell? The Taliban? That's what a lot of people are going to do. They're going to tell the Taliban. They're going to join the Taliban. They're going to join ISIS. They're going to join a terrorist group. Hello, famous horse. There's like basic, yeah, there, Shaloon brings up a good point. There's basically no oversight for war contracting. Mr. Fings, tell the UN, see what they do. They don't do anything. You want to know why? Guess who holds veto power in the UN? America, Russia, Saudi Arabia. Uh-oh. There is a problem with state power. There is a problem. And I want you to notice this. This is another thing. Do you think... In fact, in fact can we even get this? Let's see if I can find this out. Hold on, let's see. I wish we could get the polling information. Let's see if I can find it. Look how close these folks from the military industrial companies have been to the last several administrations. Cheney w was worked for Halliburton, a, a military industrial contractor. Betsy DeVos, our previous education secretary, uh, her brother was Eric Prince, the founder of Blackwater. Her husband was a founder of a fucking uh, giant sales company here. Yeah, it's bad. There are a ton of it. It's, it's wild because the military industrial complex is the government. It is the, the, the members of our, of our government are representatives and or allies of the very companies that make money off of this war. Okay? This war shit is terrible. It's fucking terrible. And it doesn't matter what Americans think. Because even though we live in a democracy, you know, we, we got a democracy, right? A very nice democracy we've got going on here. You don't get to decide on war. You don't get to really vote on war. You, you get to vote on the people who get to vote on war. But they might not, when you elect them, there might not be a war going on. You don't get to have a say. You don't do it. You just don't. Uh, sure. Although before it was causing noise, so we'll see how it goes. On the microphone? Uh, yeah. It's okay, though. It's really hot in here, so go ahead and put it up there. Yeah, I'm just talking. Uh, so here's my take, okay, everybody? There was no winning the war in Afghanistan, okay? From the moment we stepped in there, it has been a venture in profit. The only person 
that is won out of this war, or the only thing that is won out of this war, is capitalism. Not the United States, not not any specific country, certainly not the people of Afghanistan. The people of Afghanistan have n done nothing but lose. They've lost everything. They've had everything taken from them. N and, and that is despite their struggles, despite their fucking struggles. And we've lost. The, the, the earth has lost. Humanity has lost. And I want you to understand how deep that is. From the moment we got involved what is my policy suggestion for the U.S. right now? You want to know what I think we should do right now? What I think we should do right now is I think that we should commit to fixing the problem. And what I mean by fixing the problem is I mean literally saying, okay, how the fuck do we actually help people get out of here? How do we prevent the loss of life? How do we prevent, uh, how do we make sure that every refugee who doesn't want to stay there, people who don't want to stay, can get out? People who do want to stay, how do we make sure that they have the resources they need to live a good life? That's what I support. But how, I don't have any effect on this. You don't have any effect on this. None of us listening here have any fucking say on the U.S. policy in Afghanistan. Not a single motherfucking set drop. Of, we don't even have a single influence on it. We didn't have an influence on the starting of the war, and we don't have a, uh, an influence on the end of the war. There is no solution for this type of devastation. What you are watching is a train crash in slow motion. No, nothing save the in intervention of a deity could fix any of this. The only thing that we can do is challenge the state that made this possible, the, the structures that make this possible everywhere. And now you know why I'm critical of governments. Now you know why I'm critical of the state. Because the only way that we can actually resist this is by removing the powers that be, their ability to wage war like this. There should be no country in the world that has the ability to do this. Ever. The concentration of power the wielding of power over other humans is a fucking rot to the core and it and this is what it results in it results in these i don't even know, how do i even explain a situation where there are um i mean the only way i can describe it is like three wolves all tearing the shit out of a piece of meat and that piece of meat is the innocent people of afghanistan You've got Taliban taking a bite. You've got Russia taking a bite. You've got America taking a bite. And they're tearing it from shred to shred. And all of, and I want you to notice the difference here. The Taliban, the United States, Russia, these are theocratic and state constructs. You don't make cultural change by bombing and occupying a country. Oh, you do make cultural change, but you usually make it in the worst direction imaginable. You do change it. Afghanistan has changed forever. There are countless generations now, countless families that have been permanently destituted, that have been uh, permanently damned to lives of suffering and 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 pain because of what to keep the machine of capitalism going to to make money for dick cheney to make money for lockheed martin stockholders to keep the right wing in power in america guys it's not worth it okay it's not fucking worth it it is not worth whatever whatever you imagine we get from having uh, a, a, a state power of this size, whatever you think we get from having a, a United States government that is capable of doing this, that is capable of wielding this power, whatever safety you think you get from us maintaining a standing military of this size, of researching weapons that can do horrific things to people, it is not fucking worth it. And we need to change the way we think about this. 
it is and I, and I want you to understand this from another perspective I'm, I'm i'm going to be employing a lot of different metaphors here in my in my take okay but i want you to think about this for a second all right you don't know what we lost we can look at the numbers we can see how many people died we can see how many people are displaced but I just want you to think about the wonder that's in this community alone for a second, okay? Hold on a second. Let me just show you, okay? Real quick. I'm going to show you something real, real quick, okay? Ready? This is my Discord's gallery of brimstone, okay? People post their art. Look at this stuff. Look at this stuff. This is art that people have drawn look at this just in my community okay this is our art this is our art thing people sharing the stuff that they've created okay and this is just my tiny community look at this incredible incredible art incredible things over here in the fucking programming pit we've got people talking about all kinds of projects they're working on teaching each other how to program tons and tons of stuff over here in the kitchen, we have people teaching each other how to cook, making delicious foods for one another to enjoy. Here, we have people taking their photographs, sharing the world. Okay? That's just my community. Our community is 3,000 people. In just the city that we talked about earlier. How much have we lost? As a, as a race, as humanity. How much have we lost? How many breakthroughs in medical technology have we sacrificed in the name of this type of war how many incredible technologies how many solutions how many environmental scientists how many thinkers philosophers mathematicians how many artists how many mothers and fathers and children did we lose as a planet because of this war? And the number is truly immeasurable. It will literally fuck your mind. You can't even imagine it. All we can imagine is the vastness of it. It is so big we cannot even comprehend it. All we can do is know that it's huge is know that it is so big that our brains cannot even contain that information. And what, all of this for what? Security? Revenge? Profit? A nation? For nation building? So that we can preserve this idea of the United States of America, a big nation that's a superpower, an empire? So what? For what? So you can what? So that we can, uh, so that we can have, uh, in the in the big picture, so we can have a hundred different flavors of the same soda. So that we can have cars that all look exactly the same, ten different models of the same car, ten different designs of the exact same car. And, and you know what's worse? You want to know what's really sad, too? This state, this state justifies all of this, and it tells you, this is what we have to do. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, Constance, hold on a second. I want to address this. Constance says, I actually disagree with you on this, only because even if everyone you were talking about were never going to contribute to anything to science or humanity, they deserved a decent life. A decent life doesn't require contributing in any significant way. 100% agree, by the way, Constance. 100% agree with you. But I'm trying to appeal to many different people with this, okay? So I agree with you 100%. I believe that people deserve a, a life even if they're never going to contribute. But I'm trying to get people to think about this. I want people to realize what we, could, what we have lost, that the things that they are supposedly interested in. 
yes, I 100% agree with you. But what I'm trying to say is that even if we even if we take it at the neoliberal um the neoliberal face value that we're doing that we we go to these places to liberate them. What was the actual conclusion? We didn't liberate anybody. We killed millions of people. And all of those people that I'm analyzing them at face value. Yes. Humanity lost a lot for nothing. We we turned a a a huge a huge area of the planet into a blasted wasteland, so that we could get the feeling that we were doing something good. And here's the thing: here's where it gets really fucked up. Those neoliberals, those war hawks, those ne the neocons, the neoliberals, all of the warmongers out there, they tell you that that this is necessary to maintain the quality of life around the world, to maintain our standard of living, that we're doing this for democracy, we're doing this for that. Do you feel more free? Do you feel like you've actually been enriched by this? Or is it just a handful of people who are in a position selling you a motherfucking lie? Because that's what they're doing. They're selling you a motherfucking lie. We're less, and guess what? It gets even worse. Here, we now live under the TSA. We now live under the Patriot Act. We have uh, we have imported policing techniques that we used on, on populations in Iraq and Afghanistan. We use those tactics against our own populace. So not only did we not gain, but the vast majority of Americans lost. They didn't even deliver on the promises that they said. You didn't get it. They were lying all along. They got richer. But it doesn't, Constance. See, Constance says, well, they're right. Within their framework, it makes sense to go on holy wars for Western rationality or Jesus. Plus, they worry about the, they're worry about the euro in the early 200s. It doesn't. It doesn't. Those are their stated, their stated goals are also lies. You have to look at where the money went. The money went to arms manufacturers. The money went to wartime contractors. The money went, the, the power went to the Bushes. The power went to the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. It didn't go to you. It didn't go to anybody. Their framework is a lie on its fucking face. And this is why I take such a, a solid anti-war stance. And this is also why I don't really care for people prognosticating about what will happen, uh, about who was right about Afghanistan. I, I don't appreciate, I, 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 I don't appreciate, um, you know, people saying, oh, we should stay in, we should leave. None of that fucking matters at all. Not even a little bit. You don't get to decide the policy. You don't have a say in, the, in, in war. In this current paradigm, you do not have a say in war. You have to watch. You have to know. And you're told you're an American, blah, blah, blah. You're brought in. You're chained to this construct. As long as this construct exists, it will continue to attempt to chain you to it. Just pointing out this war has not improved our lives in any way but made it extremely worse. It made our lives worse. It made their lives worse. It made the world a worse place. But do you know who got rich off of it? Dick Cheney got very rich off of it. Halliburton's, Halliburton's shareholders got very rich off of it. Uh, Lockheed Martin shareholders got very, very rich off of it. 
A lot of people got a lot of political power here in America off of it. We spun up ICE. We spun up uh, we spun up a ton of money into our, our, our homeland security. We put a lot of money into surveillance, into building technology that allows people, them, that allows our government to invade and control our privacy. The modern surveillance state? You want to know, you want to know what's fucking insane? Out there, right outside, I'm pointing right out into my apartment, into my apartment complex. Did you know our apartment complex has, we have like fucking no crime here. A couple of, uh, a couple of cars have been broken into over the last two years that we've lived here. Some kids threw a rock through our window once by accident. It sucked. There are now cameras all over this entire property. Every single doorway on our property has a camera attached to it. There are literal propaganda speakers listening posts essentially i mean they're not listening they're for broadcasting information all over this property now that is what every single apartment complex in america is becoming they're becoming prisons because we justified surveillance in the name of security in the name of securing american imperialism all over the country we have built ourselves we have we have been built i shouldn't say we have built ourselves we haven't we have been built into a prison of our own making and until we recognize that until we can sit down and say oh my god these giant nationalistic structures this this forever going back and forth about who's the worst big guy who's the bad who's the big bad who's the big good as long as we buy into that fucking paradigm we will be we will continue down this path and the world will be robbed again and again and again of human beings who deserve to live. But something to know about the Panopticon. Remember, the purpose of a Panopticon is to install a cop in your own head, okay? It's to make you paranoid. Because you don't know when you're being watched. So you watch yourself. You police yourself. That's the purpose of a panopticon. All those cameras. Did you know that a lot of the cameras at, rest, at stores aren't hooked up to anything? Did you know that? Did you know that that footage sometimes just gets deleted instantaneously? Did you know that they almost never pursue any of that? Because it's impossible to sort the data. What they want you to do, it is security theater. It's security theater that designs you, that, that pushes you to police yourself, that pushes you to buy in to all of these structures. Yes, you never know when they might be on or when it might be a real camera. That's how they get you to police yourself. But it extends, you notice. This extends beyond. This, this goes on to everything. The, 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 the paranoia, the fear is used to justify this war. It's used to justify you getting on board and resignedly saying, yeah, you know what? There's just nothing I can do about this. It's, you know, it's just our only options are to keep voting and to keep, and to keep working and to keep wage cucking and to keep saying yes. Yes, you do. You do learn to be the cop of your own emotions. Yes, you do. Trust me. I know about panopticons. Listen, let me tell you about something. This is a little bit of a this is a little bit of a side line, but let me tell you about panopticons. I grew up in a religion that taught me that God was watching all the time. You want to talk about a brain fuck? Imagine believing with all of your heart, which I did, that God was always watching you. You can't even see God. You can't talk to God. You can't hear God. You he can see your thoughts. He can see everything in your mind. I grew up with that as a kid, that knowledge that that everything I did was being watched. And it led me to be a very paranoid individual when I was younger. That's a little bit of a side note, but that's how these things can unfold.
So you want my take? You want my take on all this? We we need to stop. We need to we need to oppose war. We need to oppose these em, 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 empire em, imperial states wherever they are. Whether you're whether it's Russia, whether it's China, whether it's the United States, whether it's Nazi Germany or any other of these fucking ghoulish uh, constructs that are designed like a god to hover over you, watching you, making you feel afraid to be people with, with others. Making you be afraid to be yourself. Making you afraid that if you don't support them blowing up some country you've never been to, that you're going to be punished in some way. That if they don't go and bomb Afghanistan, you won't get an iPhone. Or that, 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 that you're gonna, the economy will tank. You see, that's how they get you. They get you into thinking, they get you into buying into their lies, into thinking that, no, no, we have to do this. They manufacture your consent. They make you go, okay, yeah, I guess we have to do this by telling you false information, by baking in assumptions that aren't true. We've gone full fucking circle. And that's how they get you. That's how they motherfucking get you. But you don't have to do that. You never have to justify atrocities, ever. You do not have to do that. You don't have to justify atrocities on behalf of a state. You don't have to live in fear. And that's my take on it, okay? Hope that was a. Uh, hope that lived up to what you all wanted. Actually, I don't really care if you wanted that or not. That's my genuine belief. I just hope you had an all right time. Oh, and I know some people, by the way, just before we go any further, I know some people are going to be like, oh, well, you know, you refuse to, to put forward a policy solution because I don't have an impact on policy and neither do you. All of you are just fucking jerking off into the into your fucking hands like fucking Shinji in the hospital. That's all anybody who's sitting here telling you that we should do this or we should do that is just fucking jerking off. They don't have any say in it. You don't have any say in it. What's more important... So one thing, though. Do you agree with pulling out? We should have never been in there in the first place. I have no say in the pullout. Whatever happens is going to happen. I have no say. What am I supposed... What, what do you... What the fuck do you think? What the fuck do you think I'm gonna... What, what, what am I supposed to tell you about whether or not... It would be good at this point in time, after we've bombed a nation into the ground for 20 years, whether we should leave some soldiers there or whether we shouldn't. I don't fucking... Oh, do I look like a general to you? How about we shouldn't have ever fucking done that in the first place? How about we didn't... How about we, instead of fucking spending so much on bombs, how about is spend, instead of spending so much killing people, we actually tried to make solutions. We actually tried to give these people resources. We stopped trying to fucking hollow out their country for our corporations. There is no position. There is no right here. There is no correct answer. No matter what we do, people are going to die. If we keep troops there, we continue the cycle. If we keep troops there, maybe we make one safe area that people can flee to. But everywhere else, the Taliban will keep growing. Every building we blow up will bring them more soldiers. And if we leave, then the Taliban will take over Kabul and torture everybody inside. And, 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 and make it illegal for women to go to school. And, and, and force women to 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 uh to have to go to, to be cloven to their husbands there is no winning move here there is no winning move you don't get to win there is no right move here we don't none of us none of none of america gets to walk away clean from this you leave it's bad you stay it's bad we fucked up a long time ago Do I categorize Hiroshima as, a, as an atrocity? Uh, yes.
see this is the thing everybody is always struggling to try and uh, to try and um everybody's always trying to uh, to sit here and find justifications for atrocities but what i think we should do is we should sit back and go oh my god how did we ever let this happen how did we ever let this happen and the answers are very clear how this happened we know how this happened and we know why it happened and the only answer is to prevent it from ever happening again there is no clean solution here there will be no clean answer lots of people are going to die lots of people are going to suffer women are going to be raped children are going to be killed do you understand that men are going to be blown up men are going to be raped and killed it's already happened for 20 years. It's going to keep happening. And the entire reason why that's the case is because we can't keep our fucking fingers out of everybody's business. And that's not me to say me saying that we're, we should be isolationists or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying even in the slightest. What I'm saying is the problem is with empire. The problem is with a world full of these giant uh, military powers that want and will take. And there's not, not a damn thing that you have a say in until you recognize that that structure is unjust that there is no way that we should all collectively permit a world like this to persist existing 